and I gave Sandy the incorrect information early in the week. If you're trying to match it up to, um, to what I'm actually reading, I'll be beginning in the, in the 24th chapter of Luke, but beginning in verse number 13. Now, on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about the things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was, was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, What things? And they replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself and all the scriptures. And they came near the village to which they were going. He walked ahead of them as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and then he vanished from their sight. May God again bless the reading and hearing of this word. And may we hear a word that is to us and for us from God. Pray with me, please. Lord, we are indeed thankful for this story and those who have written it and passed it down to us. Now we pray that you would bring this written word to life in our souls through a blessing of your spirit. Speak to us through it. This is our prayer and now, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable unto you. Amen. I still know something that you don't. <laughs> and I'm still not ready to tell you. We'll come back to that later. I had an issue this past week to be solved. Oh, who am I kidding? I have issues every week, but I had a particular issue this week. But as I reflected upon it, it wasn't that big of a problem or that too difficult to deal with. As I prepared to preach on Luke's account of post-resurrection events, I still had my mind on John's gospel from last week. You might or might not know that all four Gospels give differing accounts of what happened in the events surrounding the resurrection in the days as those rumors began to circulate that Jesus was not dead, but indeed risen. I'm not troubled by those discrepancies between those who recorded these events, and I hope that you aren't either. Something life-altering, something world-altering, had shaken their lives, and they each, those closest to it, remembered it differently or stressed different pieces of it in their accounting of it. It reminds us, and I even share this for this very reason, it reminds us of the human element, element involved in the formation of the Bible. And that is an element of the Bible that I fear gets lost when we treat it like a static document, when we use it as a weapon to be used against others or to win an argument, instead of using it as a living, 
breathing document that can speak to us anew. As Anne Lamott says, and I like it quite a bit, if what you get out of reading the Bible is that the world just needs more people like you in it, or that God hates the same people that you do, open it up and read it again. Anyway, in my reading last week, I missed something, or at least I failed to, to stress something in the manner that I, that I wish that I had. I want to use that something as a lens through which to view this scene. Uh, just to remind you of where we were last week in John's Gospel, to get you up to speed if you weren't here, John's scene went like this. The disciples were gathered in this room. The doors were locked. They were afraid. They had seen what happened to Jesus, and they feared for good reason that they could meet the same fate. Well, there had been reports of an empty tomb, but this was a lot to get their heads around. And so they were hopeful, but that hope had not yet induced them to unlock the doors and to begin their work. In the midst of all of that, Jesus appeared, and it was his wounds which convinced them, if you will remember. The wounds on his hands, the wounds in his side, the wounds on his feet. Even in his resurrected state, these root wounds remained unhealed. Christian theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who called upon his German compatriots to stand up to Hitler during the horrors of the Holocaust, once said while reflecting on all that was broken in the world, only a suffering God can help. As I look at our divided world, as I look at our divided nation, as I look at our divided communities, I'm left to repeat his sentiment, only a suffering God. And a church willing to immerse itself in the world's suffering can help these days. In John's account, it was a still wounded and suffering Jesus who stood before his followers and it was his unhealed wounds which made believers out of them. But before he left the disciples, the text said he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. And that is the image I want to retrieve from last week and put it out there as a lens through which to read this story and understand this story from Luke's gospel this week. This idea that this is a continuing account of the church that Christ breathed upon. That is the image I want us to take into this passage. Well, another thing happened to me this past week. I was posed a question. I was po I've been asked the question before, but not since I arrived here in Pinehurst, so I took it as a good sign that maybe my roots are settling in. I was asked, are you the pastor of that gay church? It was inevitable. As I said, this is a question I've fielded before, and when I field it, I do some discerning, and frankly, the discerning is not that difficult to do. If I discern that the person is just misinformed about the language that we use to describe ourselves, and genuinely inquisitive and wanting to understand about what we do and why we do it, then I engage the conversation as deeply as I can. I consider it a moment for evangelism. And in that case, I will go on to explain what it means to be an open and affirming church of the United Church of Christ and the broad level of inclusion to which we hope to aspire. I'll share that we are proud of our inclusion around issues of human sexuality and gender identity, but that our aspirations involve a hope for inclusion that extends well beyond those considerations. And if they are really engaged with me, I mean, if they really wanted a conversation, I'll admit to them that sometimes we fail in these efforts in our knees a bit as a congregation, but the gospel has inspired us to keep on trying. Until all the children are at the table, we know that we have got to keep on trying. Well, if on the other hand, I discern that the questioner is not that sincere, I'll take a different route. It's akin to the response of some to the proclamation that black lives matter. 
You've probably heard the response to that by some who will say, well, don't all lives matter? Well, I'm inclined not to take the bait on that one because I believe that that represents a person not getting it on purpose. You know, it's one thing not to get it. It's another thing not to get it on purpose. And so when I hear the question, are you the pastor of that gay church? If I discern that the one asking the question is choosing not to get it, then I'll respond in a different manner. If I discern that they are simply trying to place a label on us, which they think in their minds is derogatory, or doing so because in their minds this sums us, sums us up and casts judgment upon us, then I will handle the conversation differently. Now, I promise you, I try not to get my hackles up. I do the very best I can not to get my hackles up, to get red in the face and have veins popping out of my <laughs> face. So are you the pastor of that gay church, they ask? And I will say, yes. And then I'll stop. I've lived in the South all my life, even deeper South than, than this. And so I know Southern ways. And I know that if you don't explain yourself, it throws Southern people off. <laughs> So I'll just say yes, and I'll find out that in the following silence, I'm more comfortable than they are. Are you the pastor of that gay church? I will say, yes, I am. In some cases, a follow-up question is just around the corner. It goes like this, well, well, then are you gay? Now, again, if this is a genuinely inquisitive person, I'll roll with it. I will take the time to explain how wonderful it is as a straight person to be in a community of people who are aspiring to accept me with all my quirks and, well, you know. <laughs> I will tell them as a straight person how life-giving it is for me to be surrounded by people who are doing their dead level best to provide a place of safety, sanctuary for me. I will tell them how awesome it is to have a place where I can ask my questions. Even standing right here, I can ask my questions and not be judged. I will tell them how many of my own wounds growing out of shame-based religion have been healed in places just like this. I will tell them that I'm not gay, but that I need this sort of community more than anybody. Well, if on the other hand... <laughs> I discern that these people are asking the question are intentionally not getting it and in their mind are simply passing judgment on us all. People intentionally staying stuck where they are. It's one thing to be in a place. It's another thing to be intentionally stuck there. I'll handle the question differently. So are you the pastor of the gay church? Yes, I am. Well, are you gay? I'll scratch my head a little bit and say, I don't think so. <laughs> but, but who of us really knows? <laughs> the really positive impact of that response is that I don't have to extricate myself from the conversation. They leave me, <laughs> and I'm left behind. I thought you wanted to talk. Come back. <laughs> But once I leave a conversation like that, I can't wait to get back here with you because it gives me an opportunity to tell you that a very cool thing just happened to me. I've received validation for what we are doing and the need for us to keep on doing it. And I'm not above needing validation. With all the aspiring that we do, with all the success and failure that aspiring brings, sometimes we need validation. So when somebody calls us the gay church, I consider that a badge of honor. It means that we have blurred the long entrenched and rutted and ingrained lines of inclusion enough that some folk just don't know what to do about it or even the right questions to ask. This is why when I'm asked, are you the pastor of that gay church? I feel validated and I say with a grin, oh yes, yes I am. As we consider this account of Luke's detailing a walk on the road to Emmaus, let us look at it through the lens of building a church with Christ's breath.
upon it. I have a theory about this scene. I can't prove it, but still I believe it. I believe that this road to Emmaus was walked by many more followers than those who are mentioned. And going back to John's account and the description of those who were in the upper room, I believe that a lot more people than the 11 disciples inhabited that room. I strongly suspect that that road and that room was full of women and children and others who in that patriarchal world were sometimes pushed to the margins. Tax collectors were on that road and in that room. Prostitutes were on that road and in that room. Slaves were on that road to Emmaus. The unclean and the unwanted were on that road to Emmaus and in that room with the disciples. And I say this in part because of the characters who joined Jesus on that road to Emmaus. Their names were Cleopas and an unknown disciple. Do you know what we know about Cleopas and this unknown disciple beyond this story of the road to Emmaus? Nothing. They were not mentioned before and they were not mentioned after. They were, you might say, nobodies. And yet in this story, through this encounter with Jesus, they were made into somebodies that we remember two millennia later. Last week, we concluded our Lenten book study of the biography of Martin Luther King with what I thought was a wonderful and lively discussion. But as I put that book back on my shelf to be done with it for a while this week, I was reminded of a scene in which Dr. King's mother described the role of a black parent in the raising of a child in this world to include constant efforts, daily efforts, to remind them of their somebodiness. And isn't that a part of our vocation as a church? Isn't that in no small part our vocation to remind each and every one of their somebodiness? I believe that there were other people in that upper room which John describes in his gospel. And I believe that in Luke's story, beyond Cleopas and his unknown companion, there were other nobodies discovering their somebodiness. I say that as well because of what the early church became. I'm speaking here of that church with Christ's breath upon it. Isn't that a captivating image? Well, it is for me. Jesus breathed on the early church. These followers are moving about with the breath of Christ upon them. What does it look like to be the church with Christ's breath upon it? What kind of welcome is extended in the church with Christ's breath upon it? What kinds of relationships are built with one another in the church with Christ's breath upon it? When a church has Christ's breath upon it, what is its message to the world? Perhaps just as I hear validation and those who find convenient labels to place upon us, we can find insight and validation in the charges of the critics who sought to label the early church in like manner. While still in its infancy, a man named Celsus came along, who became the church's strongest critic, and most church historians consider him to be the first to embark on a systematic attack on the early church and attempt to undermine it. This is how he described that church. This was his criticism of that church. It is a religion, he said, of women, children, and slaves. That statement grew up in a world in which, by and large, the people named women and children and slaves were not among those with power and place. Celsus was among those confused by the blurring of the lines. In that patriarchal world, the church with Christ's breath upon it had so blurred the lines of inclusion that those who were in their culture were disempowered. They were empowered in the church with Christ's breath upon it. That in that world, those who had no place in the church with Christ's breath upon it were given places of honor. Those pushed to the margins of society and the church with Christ's breath upon it find themselves in the very heart and center of the ministry of the church. 
The lines had been so blurred that critics like Celsus were left to place labels on the church which were meant to be derogatory and damning, but to the church with Christ's breath upon it, they were worn like badges of honor. Perhaps some of the early leaders in the church were asked similar questions to what we are asked. Are you part of that religion of women and children and slaves? I hope that at least some of them smiled and said, you bet I am. When the lines have been so blurred as to extend the circle beyond places that some imaginations can bear, leaving them only able to, to cast labels upon it, then that church, in all of its aspiring, in all of its succeeding and failing, of all of its walking and sometimes stumbling, it's doing something right. It is moving about with Christ's breath upon it. So I will leave you with the words of an old hymn. Breathe on us, breath of God. Fill us with life anew. That we might love what and who thou dost love. And do what thou dost do. Breathe on us breath of God until every wall which separates and divides has been crumbled to dust. Breathe on us breath of God until every child has a place at your table. Breathe on us breath of God. Amen.